G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Martin. Today, we've got Dwayne Long from my property management team along and uh, he's been on some past episodes. He's been with me for 10 years, won lots of awards in the industry, including the Rewa Property Manager of the Year in 2013. So he really knows his stuff and he helps a lot of our clients at the front end work out whether a property should be purchased uh, in terms of its rentability and also helps them uh, on board with us. So get in touch with him if you do uh, want to discuss uh, renting out your properties, check out our website. But uh, today, our topic is on renting out dual key properties specifically. So it can give you a lot more income, but also, as the title suggests, give you a lot more headaches if things aren't set up right. So today, we're going to go through some of the benefits and the considerations so that you can have smooth sailing with a dual key property. Let's go inside. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management specialist servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here is your host, Jared Mann. G'day, Dwayne. Thanks for joining me to chat through renting out dual key properties. Excited about this one, I am. I'm very excited too. Lots of pros and cons in this one. So looking forward to covering it off. We often get asked, don't we, um, should I buy a dual key property? And uh, people are looking at properties with granny flats on. Um, sometimes that dual key can be two rentable dwellings under the one roof. And then there's others that are considering, you know, should I put a granny flat onto an existing property? And they're wondering, you know, is there going to be potential issues and is is the benefits worth all that? So what are some of your thoughts? Look, like I said, there's lots of <laughs> lots of pros and cons to this particular subject, but uh, I think if you do it right, it's definitely worth it. Um, if you're sort of going unprepared, then there's a lot of issues that we need to overcome. Well, let's you know, dive into some of this now. So before we do, what is a dual key property? Let's let's back the truck up and get a bit of an explanation just to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. Uh, look, I guess the way we look at it is pretty much two rentable dwellings on the same title. Um, it can be under the same roof. So you might have a three by one and a one by one in an, under one roof, under one household, or you may have a house with a detached granny flat, um, otherwise known as an ancillary or secondary dwelling. Yeah. Okay. So Basically, you got one title, it hasn't been subdivided, and you've got two pretty separate rentable spaces. Yes, right. and that's the key thing, Jared. It's got to be pretty separable. You can't have it as a bit of a mixed shared accommodation style. Um, that definitely doesn't work. We're not going into that one today. More so, how can we have two dwellings set up, two tenancies set up, clearly defined? Um, and that's what we're going to cover off today. So is it ever a good idea to do this? What are some of the positives? Granny flat can obviously achieve you a greater level of income, a higher level of stability. You've got the ability to have one property rented, the other one may be vacant while you're finding a tenancy. You've got that cash flow that's coming through. The complexity comes because you've got two tenancies. Um, and I guess from this perspective, it can result in more headaches. And uh, also, again, if you're underprepared, not just headaches from the tenancies, but headaches from you know things like utilities and shared driveways and common space. So that's why we've got to make sure we set it up properly. Yeah. So if it's not done well, it can result in more headaches. And we've had a lot of people that have come to us with the um, things in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Saying, uh, how do we get out of this? You know, we've already got tenants in place and it hasn't been set up right. And uh, in many cases, we can give people advice, but it's very hard to go fixing things once you know, you've already mid-tenancy and, and and things haven't been thought out as well as they should be. Precisely, 100%. So let's take a look at a specific example of a property with a client that he brought us to us for some input just this week. How was that particular property set up? Give us an insight. Okay, so this particular property um, marketed as a single dwelling as a five by three. Um, what we could potentially do with this is rent it out as a four by two with a pool and a separate granny flat, a one by one in its own right. Now, it's a corner site. So it has separate driveways and separate access, which is great because we can then talk about exclusive use. What we would be fetched for this particular property is a five by three, not a lot of comparable data for five by threes in that area, but we're probably looking at around 700 to 750 per week. Um, 
what would each rent out individually? Probably 550 to 600 for the four better and somewhere between 300 to 350. So, you know, when you're looking at the comparison of somewhere between 850 to 950 when you're renting both units out separately compared to approximately 750, there's definitely a little bit more that you can get and add to that yield. You know, potentially an extra $150 to $200 a week and, you know, over a year it adds up to helping an investor potentially hold a property or go further into being positive cash flow, especially with interest rates coming up, you'd think. Yeah, I I tend to agree. And that's, I think, the biggest driver for a lot of people that speak to myself is that they want to have that little bit extra for serviceability, positive gearing, and that's what they're doing it for. Now, we can probably go into in another episode what it may cost to set up and to install a, um, a granny flat itself and potentially retrofit a house. You can also build houses that are designed to be dual key you know, from the start. But in this market, obviously, building costs are going up. So it's a lot better if you can buy an established property that already has it set up. It's going to be easier on your financing because uh, often you can't also finance a, a granny flat or, and it's harder to finance a, a dual key property when you build it. Um, so it's great if it sticks within you know the normal re- residential lending rules and policies and you can get an 80% lend uh, when it's already set up that way. So that's just a little side note. But um, going further into some of the practical considerations now, Dwayne, what are we looking at having set up right and giving consideration to when we go about trying to find two tenants and set this up to be stress-free? Quite a big list to this. And uh, obviously, we can speak uh, directly with anyone who's interested in doing something like this. But a couple of things- It needs to be case by case with each person, doesn't it? And each property. So why don't we start by looking at the services side of things? Because that's the biggest area to to, consider firstly. Uh, as you said, if you're looking at a retrofit or building, um, either way, you still need to consider the gas, electricity, and the water use that each tenant will be paying. You can choose to have that separately metered, that is having a sub meter installed so that you can read which property is using how much and thereby splitting that bill between the two properties. I think that's probably the most fair method, but it does cost a little bit more to obviously set up. Otherwise, you might look to just do a percentage split. So for the example above where we've got a four bedroom and a one bedroom, you might look at agreeing to 70% of the electricity bill to be paid by one and 30% to be paid by the other. Um, Other thing to consider is whether or not your gas and electricity will be set up in the owner's name or the tenant's name, the main tenant's name, and how that would look like in terms of getting the compensation paid back to the relevant party. And I guess it's easy enough from what I understand to have a sub meter for electricity. But as far as I know, you can tell me differently, but I I don't know if it can be set up that way with water and gas. What's your understanding? I believe you can still set a sub meter up for water. For gas, how we have seen this occur is that the rear property, say the granny flat in this instance, won't have any gas running. Yeah, It'll be running on, a on electrics. Electric hot water unit, electric stove, but these are things to be considered when setting up. Um, and that's what's really important about uh, making sure that it's a fair split for both parties. So what's some of the other uh, factors to do with the services and electrics? that we've got to look at? Yeah, so uh, a big one that I've noticed as well is smoke alarms. So in any dwelling, in either dwelling, you're going to have to have smoke alarms that are hardwired. That's not so much of an issue, but if they're connected, so the main dwelling sets their smoke alarm off when they're cooking and the ancillary dwelling's alarm is set to be connected so that one goes off too, you're going to have a very upset tenant when both of them are firing at the same time. The other thing is RCDs. Again, if they're on the same circuit, hasn't been thought through. Imagine the scenario, and we've seen it, where both tenants are running their oven and their dishwasher and their washing machine and dryer at the same time and overloads the circuit. Of course, you wouldn't expect all of those appliances running at once, but sometimes two is enough to draw and create a short circuit. So those things should really be set up a little bit differently um, and on their own circuits if possible to mitigate that. Yeah, that makes sense. And what are some of the other factors to consider? Look, bins is a good one as well to think about. Um, Generally speaking, your councils won't give you a separate set of bins for the secondary dwelling. So you're going to have to um, look at sharing bins and that's more of an expectation management when you're speaking with both tenants. Same with your letter. Councils do at a cost only provide 
you know, the ones that are bins free, but then you can order others at a cost, I know. So that's, yeah, that's right. an option. Case by case, um, some councils won't. So it's about finding the specific data for your um, property. Um, I guess you, gotta, you, could, you should think about how they're put out and where they're stored when they're brought back in. And, you know, four or five bins is a lot to keep <laughs> at the front of a property too if it hasn't been thought out. That's right, precisely. Other things to think about is your registered address for your post. So you call it 10B, but there's not actually a 10B registered address so you know we've had instances where australia post won't leave the mail there because it's not 10b that's a 10a letterbox for argument's sake um so it can be a little bit confusing um and also regards to letterbox you, you probably can't have two there as i just mentioned having an a and a b if there's not a registered address so it uh, can become a little bit tricky uh, you'll speak to your council to see what they might be able to do help you um, in this particular situation as well then we get into you know some of the other factors in terms of like overall use of the properties let's go through some of those yeah look as i mentioned before with the um example that we shared it had separate driveways so you can literally put a fence up between the two dwellings and you have your exclusive use areas the great thing about exclusive use is you can hold responsibility and accountability to each party so if you do have a common driveway they both argue the other person should be doing the weeds or arguing that the water needs to be done by tenant a not tenant b for the plants so the exclusive use areas means that they can have that place, that area, and, you know, basically not have anyone bother them. But also, more importantly, it's about making sure we can hold them responsible. And that ties straight into the privacy side as well. Um, we've had a couple of dwellings where the granny flat's at the back and built as a granny flat, not as a separate dwelling. We've tried to rent it out, but the issue is that the people living at the back have to walk down an alleyway that's maybe about a metre, a metre and a half wide um, from the front to the back, which goes past the master bedroom window and another bedroom window. Now, who knows what people get up to in their bedrooms at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, um, but the idea is that that reduces the amount of privacy for that particular tenant and both tenants obviously don't like that kind of feeling. So, it's really important to think about how you set up access and think about each other's privacy as well. Hmm. Good one. And what about noise and, you know, potentially impacting each other's? Yeah, so this is probably not so much for that granny flat setup. It's more for the dual key kind of two residents under one roof space. What we've noticed before um, is that if you've got that kind of setup and the living room backs onto a bedroom, one tenant inevitably gets annoyed because the other tenant's having the TV on a little bit too loud, whatever it might be. Purpose-built dual key homes usually have a wall up in the ceiling space to prevent the two, the noise traveling into the ceiling space and traveling over. Yeah, um, and if you, I think they call it a firewall as well. Yeah. It actually stops fire spreading in the roof space as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's exactly it. So that's that's perfect. But also, um, you know, you might look at putting a door on, um, say, a hallway to close off two separate areas. You might want to insulate that between the two doors to stop that noise transfer getting through. So it is important to think about that, um, and that's one of the considerations you need to think of before splitting a four by two into two separate dwellings. Yeah, okay. So you've also got some other one. Here's what else is, should we be considering? Um, look, parking vehicles are very, very important in WA. It's almost like you can't live without a car. So um, you've, you've really got to consider how you split that driveway up or um, how you can find access for the two vehicles to park. Um, I've had one where they've spray painted a section of the driveway into a little rectangle to say that's unit B. Um, and that gives you sort of indication that, you know, that's an exclusive use area. Um, once again, you'd probably use your Google Maps to draw a bit of a overview to show the exclusive use and, and where to park a car. We don't want people backing up and parking in tandem and blocking each other in because that's how disputes can, can start. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so All these I mean, things we've learned over the years, um, you know, we're a lot wiser through uh, having gone through these things, aren't we? Yeah, a hundred percent. And um, you know, if everyone, some, I shouldn't say everyone, each one has a unique setup, and that's what's probably most important to speak to someone like us to tell you what needs to be done um, to make sure that it is set up properly and we can minimise that headache moving forward. So any other final things to consider? Yeah, a couple actually. Um, phone lines as well. So if you've got um, a main dwelling with a phone line, chances are they're not going to run a separate phone line in for the rear dwelling. Um, you might have to go with, say, a pentanet or some 5G dongle. Um, but again, you just want to set that expectation 
with the tenant. You, you don't want them coming in thinking they can have MBM and fiber in. So again, it's just an expectation thing. Alarm systems as well, a, a really big one. You don't want the whole property on the same alarm system. So, you know, the ancillary d- dwelling um, sets the alarm off and it wakes up the whole front house. You know, we have to make sure those alarm systems are either decommissioned, turned off or, or not in use or set up correctly. Once again, there are things that we need to consider as well with regards to disputes between residents. So how do you handle that? You I was here for five years, so this is how it was with the last tenant and my neighbour. Why can't it be the same as what you guys, you've only been here for six months, so, you know, get used to it. We've really got to make sure the right people fit in. Like, it it is so important to find the right tenants in this. Um, Otherwise, it just simply does not work. Yeah, and it can be challenging, I guess, when the owner still lives in the front house and they're renting out a rear one. Generally, that's not something that we take on for management. The owner's probably going to be best served managing their own granny flat when it's at the rear of their house. But it's a little sometimes even easier when you've got two independent people that, you know, one doesn't have it over the other in in any regards. And, you know, then you can fall back on what's in the lease and hold you know, both parties account um, properly, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure, 100%. And I think the last thing just to consider as well is what this might do to your landlord insurances um, and what the implications are for those policies. So speak to your landlord insurer, uh, make sure that, you know, they can cover the two tenancies under the one dwelling. You might need two policies. You have to speak to your insurer to make sure that you are covered. Uh, Don't assume that the one policy will cover both. Yeah, and don't assume that they'll necessarily cover in a granny flat per se. So, yeah, worth asking the question on that one. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, I mean, this all comes down to finding the right tenants. Um, I think that's the most important, whether you live in there and renting out your back property or you've got two people in there, you've got to get two lots of people that can actually get along. Um, Otherwise, this is they're just too close to each other for it to not be. Really good advice there, Dwayne. So thank you taking, for taking us through all those um, considerations. I guess in summary, what I'm hearing is it can be worth it, especially for that extra rental yield, when, yep. uh, especially when interest rates start coming back up and just gives you that breathing room, gives you that you know st- extra stability of income, especially if the leases are written to expire at different times and you have one tenant moving out and the other staying. But there is a lot of headaches there that can come out if it's not set up right. You know, mm-hmm. I've even picked up and learned, <laughs> learned a few things today. So thank you for that. I guess if anyone does have a property that they're thinking of renting out this way or considering purchase, best to get in touch with us before they get too far down the road so that we can uh, set things up to be stress-free. Yes. And on that note, Jared, that's 100% correct. Speak to us first, because if there are already tenants in there and leases aren't drawn or exclusive use areas aren't set, retrospectively, it's very difficult to change expectations with those tenants. And sometimes it's a matter of fleshing that out um, up front or kicking these ones out and then trying to find some other ones that can actually agree to the terms that make this work for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast today, mate. I'll catch you again uh, on a topic soon. Awesome. Take care. Bye.